years, I believe science might offer an answer to the curse of the Bambino. Why someone took so long to hire that guy is beyond me. Anybody who's not tearing their team down right now and rebuilding it using your model, they're dinosaurs. One of the great things about money is it, it buys a lot of things. One of which is the luxury to disregard what baseball likes, doesn't like, what baseball thinks, doesn't think. <laughs> This is threatening, not just a way of doing business, but, it's, but in their minds, it's threatening the game. How can you not be romantic about baseball? All right, welcome to another Baseball Ops podcast. So, we're going down the same road. I know a lot of people aren't going to like this podcast. I know I'm probably pissing a lot of people off. I mean, it's obvious from the one we did with Noah and Jason that there were a lot of people upset about it. So, I'm just going to apologize up front that I'm continuing to rub your nose in this. Um, I would just suggest you don't listen if you don't want to learn about, or you don't want to hear another story about someone who has been down this conventional road of velocity training with extreme throwing or with high intent weighted ball training. Guys, the only reason I'm doing this is because if I don't continue to allow people to tell their story, they don't, their voices aren't heard. And then people are blindly falling into the down, going down the same roads that they went down with no cautionary tale. So I just feel like I'm doing my d- due diligence to provide that cautionary tale. I'm not saying my approach is better because I don't do this. I do feel that way. If you feel like that's why I'm doing this, then I apologize if that's the way you feel. Um, obviously, there is some sense to say, hey, pay attention Uh, to what I'm doing because I've worked really hard after me, who's another testimonial to extreme throwing injuries, rotator cuff tear at 18, has worked very hard to create an alternative, which rebuilt my career. So yes, there is a little bit of that in there. But most importantly, I know how important it is for these guys to have voices to help future young pitchers coming up and not to fall victim to the same stuff. That there, There is a strong conscience in me to say that I must do this because this is an issue. Um, and I'll tell you right now, if my program had serious injury coming out of it, I've been doing this for 10 years. I, By God, I would have changed it. If I didn't, I I, I deserve to go to hell. I mean, I, I would really have, um, I would really personally be in a bad place. Um, I couldn't live with myself. I couldn't sleep at night. I'm just that type of person. Um, I, the one thing with the 3X programs, I've worked very hard to make it as good as I can get all the time and make things better. But the approach has always been ground up because it was built after a guy who went through injury. So I, it, it, it was already set. The, the process for the 3X programs already put into place coming from a, a better perspective because it was coming from an injured pitcher's approach to developing a better program. Um, and that's why I want to get this out there because I want people to understand um, everything changes once you have an injury. Everything, your whole perspective on baseball changes when you have an injury. And that's what you're going to hear when you listen to Trent today. You're going to hear a very different perspective on the game. I know y'all are going to criticize him a lot because you might, more than likely, you're going to criticize him because you're you're actually going down a bit of his road. And that's why you're going to criticize him because you don't want to hear that you're going to be sidelined in the next year or so. But you have to understand, guys, the reason I'm putting this out is for you. It's for you that are going down these roads to tell you, hey, you need to do a better job looking into what you're doing to your body. Are you making sure you're putting yourself through in you know into the best approach or putting setting yourself up or preparing yourself uh to to experience fully experience this game and and not cut it short because um you were you were you know you were caught in a bad approach or you were you were ignorant to what was going on i mean Steven, jump in on this. So I don't think Steven really wants to be in this podcast right now, but jump in on this. I'm, I just, it's, I, I, I think people need to hear two sides of the story, but then they're also going to, I already know from the last one, everything um, that they're going to say. But at the same time, you just need to hear both sides so guys out there can make a more educated decision 
um, on what they do. And I think, you know, even if even in people that have weighted ball approaches, like hopefully it, it, it forces them to educate guys more on to not just jump into this blindly, um, you know, and, and, and they have protocols, then, um, you know, guys need to, uh, guys need to just be aware of, uh, what their body's telling them. If, I mean, if you're going through pain doing it, maybe back off, you know, like there's, there's, t- I don't know. I don't even know what to say because it's, it's, I already, I already see what's going to happen from this, from the last one and the one after this and the one after that. There'll always be excuses, excuses, excuses to it. Um, well, not only that, attack. Yeah. We, we don't really enjoy getting attacked. It's not that much fun. It's not fun to get bloodied up putting this stuff out. But I don't also, I don't want to cower and be intimidated by these coaches that uh, don't want this information out there. I think that's the ridiculous aspect of this whole thing. I mean, I understand if someone came out and said, everyone's blowing their arms out doing 3X pitching, even though I'm not attacking a camp here, I'm attacking a high intent weighty ball training from anyone. Or just baseball year round throwing. Right, extreme throwing. But if someone came out and had legitimacy to show that I was injuring all these people, I might initially attack, like, who's trying to take advantage of me? But if then if someone came to me and said, no, this is legitimate, Brent, look, you are you were killing people. Like, you're ruining people. You're putting one guy after the other under the knife. I'm going to be like, oh, crap. What the hell? And I would make an adjustment. I would stop attacking. I would address the issue. I would reach out to that, whoever's putting that out, and I'd say, I understand what you're doing. I'm going to take an initiative to do better at this. I'm going to start doing some educational videos uh, on on what I've done wrong and how to get better at it. Um, I know that sucks. That's very humbling. I may never have to do that in my career. Once again, because I came into this with a perspective of an injured pitcher. But I know that, that I would do this. So it's like we don't like getting attacked on this end. But I understand why they're attacking. So I'm not like really upset with the people that are attacking me, but I'm also not going to stop putting this information out because I'm scared of people attacking me. Yeah. I, I mean, how does that make you feel? I, I, I agree. I mean, it's, um, I just feel like people have just like accepted that baseball has like this arm injury thing and we accept it. Like, like it's okay. Like every, like people get hurt in everything. So let's just, Let's just accept it. But it, uh, when there's this pattern of injury and then it's not just happening at the MLB level, uh, you know, it's happening to a lot of high schoolers and young kids. Uh, it's an issue that I think is can be significantly uh, cut down if we just start getting away from these uh, extreme throwing approaches, year round throwing, high intent throwing weighted balls. And that's that's why I want to get. Uh, the information now or I mean even with even with weighted balls if it came around to where I don't think it's going to happen but if they if you come around to where you can significantly reduce the pattern of injury then of course that's great but that that it's not I've you look at the studies you look at you look at overuse you look at uh, poor uh, poor pitching mechanics poor physical fitness it, it doesn't add up there's no there's no magical way with uh, you know um, I don't, I don't, what it, what's the terms they, they use for it where it's like you have to build up to uh, your throws and, the, you know, like volumes and intensities. I don't think there's some magical formula of, of year-round throwing or throwing through your off-season that's going to keep you from, uh, from injury. Right. Um, I know there's a lot of organizations out there saying that their protocol keeps you safe. But then I also hear of injury coming from their camps um and you're right people say well there's everyone's getting injured yeah but who's getting injured more so think about it we were all everybody a lot of people were dying from cigarettes uh, and their excuse was well everyone dies but eventually no one wanted to smoke because no one really wanted to die sooner than they were supposed to die that's the kind of the same thing here yeah everyone's getting injured but We're finding with this high or these extreme throwing approaches, they're getting injured faster and more serious. And hopefully when the information gets out, just like with the cigarette companies, when the information gets out, less people go, hey, I don't I know I'm going to hurt, get hurt, but I don't want to get hurt and end my career at 15 like Trent or, you know, or eventually 19. 
Um, and and that's that's so that's the case. It's not that we're getting injured. It's that we're getting more injured now, and the injury is more serious, and we're ending careers earlier, uh, like in the case of Trent. So that's the problem, and that that's what we're trying to educate, purely educate. So as much as I know you, if you're still listening, you probably want to hear the story of Trent, and he deserves to tell a story. This guy um, has a really important story to hear, and he actually has a message with it. We didn't just interview someone and force him to tell a story. Uh, he reached out to us, and he has a message. And that's why he deserves to tell a story, because he tells what happens, and then he has this message behind it. And it's enlightening. It's enlightening when you hear this guy talk about how he ignorantly went into this. I mean, you hear it. He says he was ignorant. He didn't know any other way. But at the end, he starts talking all profoundly about how the arm works and what he did wrong and what he learned. And, and, and then he reaches out to people and says, this is what I want to tell them. That's when you realize his story deserves to be told. So here goes. This is Trent's story. All right. We got Trent Motis here. Trent, um, thanks for being on the show today, man. I appreciate this. We, I know it was tough getting you on, but I appreciate you coming on, man. No problem at all. Thanks for having me. Cool. And so the reason I wanted to get you on and, you know, with the podcast, um, I, I don't want to kind of t talk about it. I really want you to tell the story, but it's really a, more of just bringing up uh, the high risk of weighted balls that um, I've been basically putting out for years on, on top velocity. And now I just want guys to tell their story because I think everybody's been listening to me. In hearing me talk, and I think a lot of the critics and you know those on the other side of this are are starting to come at me like I'm I'm making a lot of this up, or you know I think they're just tired of hearing me. So I, I I'm really trying to bring guys like you on, more of guys like you, so y'all can tell your story because I know everybody's sick of probably listening to me about it. So I really want you to tell all of your story and and people understand what you've gone through and and kind of tell what you've learned from it and. Um, you know how you've come out of it so why don't you start with um with uh basically i remember when when you were posting how um you were 15 and and you first had your first um, arm injury talk about like the, the the process that led to that injury and uh what now that you look back at that because you're you said you're 24 i think now that you look back at that what uh what do you credit for that injury what do you think what 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 was the the process that caused that uh, probably year round baseball with no breaks in there with high intent on weighted, you know, weighted baseball training without the proper like base to go off of. Instead of de developing my body as a whole, I was isolating my arms specifically with the weighted baseballs. And so I think it kind of just puts uh, unneeded stress on my arm before my whole entire body was ready. Because like you said, people are late bloomers sometimes and I was a late bloomer. So I think trying to force myself to get my velocity before it was needing to be there, it kind of put a stress on my labrum on there. And, you know, after a while wear and tear on that, it kind of just gave out and blew off completely in there. So I kind of obtained, you know, the weighted baseballs and isolating that arm specifically instead of getting my body as a whole ready for it. That's definitely where I think that came from. So kind of like walk us through it. So you're 15 at the time and why did you want to get into some coaching or if it was was it velocity training back then i mean what led you to this kind of coaching um just trying to get prepared for college baseball because that was what i was aiming for at that age because i was a four-year letter in high school as a freshman you know and i had all these people looking at me but then i get turned away because like they say velocity gets you in the door and throwing strikes keeps you there. I threw a lot of strikes, but my velocity wasn't there at that young age. So I was trying to do anything possible to try and get, you know, that five to six mile an hour more on my fastball or anything like that, just so people would look at me more. So you're, you're 15, you're throwing how hard? Uh, probably low seventies. Okay. And so you went to this coach with the desire of velocity? Yeah, velocity and some mechanic training. And I didn't really ever have any mechanic problems 
um, before then or any arm pain before then. But as soon as I started training, tweaking my mechanics a little bit and using weighted balls, I got pain all the way from the elbow up to the shoulder constantly. And then I just learned to live with it and throw through it. So he basically, did he implement weighted balls in right away? Yeah, right away. I mean, he implemented the elastic bands for a warm up and then straight into weighted balls for a warm up. I'd throw like 10 ounce plyo care balls from a full stretch position. So it's basically isolating nothing but my arm and my elbow to get that weighted ball thrown. So I was using no body movement, no like pitching mechanics. It was nothing but arm trying to get that arm muscle built up. So basically he just took what delivery you had and he just loaded you with the, the heavier balls at the time. Yep, right away. What was his purpose? Did he kind of tell you why he was doing the way he was doing it? Did he give you an explanation? Basically to build up the muscles to that help decelerate and, ex and accelerate my arm speed. It was all about arm speed at that time. It was not overall strength. It was just isolating the arm to try and get it to pick up on arm speed. Then how did how did it progress? Like where did it go? Did you start doing um, any diff type of different throws? Um, yeah. Where did um, it go from there? We, did, uh, we went from like throwing a f obviously start with five ounce baseball on a mound, and then we'd work our way up to a six, to a seven, to an eight, and to a ten off the mound. And at that time, I didn't know throwing a weighted baseball off of a mound put way more stress on your arm than throwing it on flat ground. And then I'd work my way down to like three ounce and two ounce crow hop pull downs. So you started really that, putting some some speed behind the ball th with the momentum in, yep. in the crow hops. Yep. Did, did you feel any more pain in those throws than, than any of the other throws? Um, actually, throwing on the mound with a weighted baseball took more pain in my shoulder, but the crow hop pull downs all isolated in my elbow. That's when I started getting the tendonitis in my elbow and, you know, more pain than I've ever felt throwing on those long pull downs. So. so did you have much pain in your throws coming into this form of training? No, I never had any problems with arm pain. And I was typically a kid that threw every three days playing year round because I was one of the only kids on my team that would, you know, throw strikes. And I'd have constant uh, coaches that would leave me in at a young age, between 80 and 110 pitches, and that was no problem for me to do. My dad started keeping track on me, and then, you know, I get told from some people that that was way too many pitches to be throwing at a young age, and it just continued through high school. But then with those weighted baseballs, throwing that many pitches every three days or whatever it was that they had me throwing, it just put way too much wear and tear on my arm at that time. Did you let the coach know that it, uh, your arm was bothering you or you are experiencing arm pain? And I was one of those that, you know, I wanted to be in all the time and I wouldn't say anything because I didn't want to get pulled out. And so I always just threw through the pain because baseball was what I had. It's what I wanted. And I wasn't going to let anybody take me out of it. And I wasn't going to let anything bring me away from the game, even if it was just arm pain. Hmm. So a lot of those that probably hearing this are going to say, well, you know, you already were throwing a lot. So there was a lot of wear and tear before you did the weighted balls. But I understand that, but do you feel like the weighted balls exaggerated the the overuse? Did it throw you into more yeah. overuse? Yeah, speed like I'll speak of it in like a rubber band. My arm felt like fine, like a tight rubber band before I started the weighted baseball programs, but then as soon as I started throwing weighted baseballs, it felt like I was stretching that rubber band out too far and then it became not so tight anymore. And my arm just was constantly hurting. I always had pain in it throughout the whole day. And then it'd take me, you know, what it took me 10 minutes to get my arm warm would take me 35 to 40 minutes just to feel okay to throw a ball at high intent anymore. That, that makes perfect sense because the, the six-week study ASMI did on, on the high intent weighted ball training was that they actually, you gained more range of motion in your throwing arm than your non-throwing arm, which when they threw the five ounce balls, uh, that never happened. So it's interesting you say that because that's actually what the studies are showing that you're gaining more range of motion. So you probably feel like your arm is being stretched out. So that, that's what you were feeling? Yeah, exactly. I was feeling like 
my throwing arm specifically was way more flexible and getting stretched out to a point where it probably shouldn't have been. No, then, so this pain kept escalating and escalating. And when did you eventually go to the doctor? Um, it was probably the end of my sophomore year when I really thought something was wrong in my shoulder. You know, I had the normal pain in my elbow, but then when I really, really had that pain in my shoulder at my last game of the season, um, I went to a doctor. He said to keep an eye on it, and I played the whole next three months of summer baseball And because I had already paid a deposit and I didn't want to sit out for that. I know that sounds silly, but, you know, like I said, I wasn't one to pull myself out just for pain. And then at the end of those three months, I came back to the doctor and had a complete labrum tear. Did, did the doctor um, tell you why he think you're, you had the labrum tear? Overhead throwing and overuse of that. And how much weighted ball throwing were you doing at the time that it tore? I was doing about as much as you could. I was doing it in season and out of season. Every I probably do it two or three days a week. Because that's how how often I would be going to my trainer. Even with the pain, you just kept doing the throwing. Yep, even with the pain, I just kept doing the throwing because I didn't really want to face the fact that I had pain going on in there. Because, like I said, I wanted to play college ball and I didn't want that to go away. So I think a lot of people are going to criticize and say, well, why didn't you stop with the pain? I mean, so say you would have stopped. So say the pain, you, you just you listen to it and you stop the training. Um because I mean, how would would what would you have done? I mean, what's the alternative for you if were in the position you were if if you would have listened to the pain? I guess you knew of no other form of training, right? Yeah, I knew no other form of training. I mean, I had experience with lifting because of uh, football and basketball and stuff like that, but I I know no other forms of training for baseball besides what I was being told. And with the pain, you know, I did say oh to my parents you know i got a little pain here a little pain there um but at the time it wasn't unbearable to me and i didn't think anything was torn or tweaked as bad as it was i thought it was just you know oh tendonitis here like i'd been diagnosed with my within my elbow because then you just ice and you take care of your arm more than you normally do and i didn't think i had a major issue until that last time i went to the doctor because it was that major issue probably happened within two months do you feel like if if you had been shown a better alternative to gain velocity that didn't involve so much throwing that at that point you would have been willing to try that? Did you were you what I'm saying is were you did you feel stuck like you were pushing through the pain because you really wanted to make the velocity gains and you knew that that you didn't know any other way to do it? Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, I the only two things I had was people telling me try with weighted baseballs or just wait until your body caught up to you and velocity comes with age. And those were literally the two solutions I was given at that time. And I had no other option. So it was either a wait until I was, you know, 19 or 20 and already in college and somebody's passed on me because I'm not throwing, you know, 82, 83, or just train how I was and try and get to there then. So when you had the surgery, what did, what did they uh, exactly do to your arm? Uh, for the complete labrum tear, what they did is they put three titanium anchors in the collarbone and then shaved the uh, basically the socket down so that the labrum would reattach itself to the bone. And then they anchored the labrum down with those three uh, titanium anchors drilled through my collarbone. And that was the first surgery. So when you came out of surgery, um, how, how did it feel once you got out of rehab back to throwing? super stiff super stiff like i had no mobility in it at all did you gain full range of motion eventually um after a little while yeah um but i still felt like i had no strength in it and there was always kind of like a constant popping to it because of those anchors in my collarbone so i just never felt right after that so what did you do? Obviously, you didn't want to give up on baseball. What did you do to get back? Uh, what what was uh, what did you decide to do as far as training to get yourself back? Go right back to what I was told would get me to velocity and full range of motion. Because like I was saying with the uh, with the weighted baseballs, I felt like I was having more range of motion with that arm, and I was trying to get back to that full range of motion after my surgery because I didn't feel like I was there. So I went right back into 
a little bit of lifting and more weighted balls because at the time I was told if you lift too much and get too bulky, you lose the elasticity in your muscles and then you lose the range of motion. You can't throw anymore. So you just went right back into the same training, correct? Yeah, pretty much. So what happened? So you start back into that training. Did, did you start to fall into pain again? Yeah, after, you know, going through my senior year of – uh, baseball there in high school uh, I went to college and I tried to walk on and about two or three weeks into um, practicing and throwing bullpens I went to the coach told him you know I'm not feeling right something else is wrong there so he sent me to a trainer and the trainer looked at me for 10 minutes and referred me out to a specialist and then I was right back under the knife again having another surgery Jeez. so how quick did the other surgery come between after the first one a uh, year and a half a year and a half, and how much throwing had you had done in that year and a half? Well, probably a year of it because for the first six months of that, I wasn't allowed to do any form of weight training, any form of throwing, anything at all after that first surgery. So what did your throwing in include? Was it just big, typical, just like working you out to distances, building up intensity? Yeah. You know, extended long toss, trying to get from foul pole to foul pole, you know, uh, and then working it in and then two to three ounce pull downs at about I don't know, 100, 120 feet. And then, you know, uh, 60 foot, six inch uh, weighted baseball throws with a maxing out at a 10 ounce ball. So how so that's within six months. Are you doing it that much or was that even later than that after surgery? The weighted baseballs with the 10 ounce, uh, maxing out at 10 ounce was probably eight months after surgery, but within the first two months after the six months, so the first two months of me throwing, I was doing under under loaded baseballs, so the two to three ounce pull downs with trying to get extended on a long toss and then a regular baseball. And was and then this after that? Sorry, finish it. No, you're fine. And then after that, it moved up to the six ounce, seven ounce, eight ounce, and 10 ounces within the first two months after the full six month rehab. So was this off of your own programming or was this a coach once again working with you? It was another coach working with me, you know, another one that believed in uh, weighted baseballs to try and gain, gain that full mobility back. That was basically the main focus after that first surgery was trying to get full mobility back. So you started before the, before the second surgery, you started to have pain again. Was it come, some of the same pain that you had before the first surgery? It was a little different. It was actually um, more of in my bicep than it was in my elbow and in my shoulder directly. Um, but what I ended up figuring out was that the bicep was pulling on what they had just fixed in that first surgery. And so that's why I was having inflammation and the popping feeling because it was trying to basically destroy what they had gone in and fixed. Well, I, what, I mean, I'm even curious on what was the first coach telling you when your pain showed up? And then what was the second coach telling you when your pain showed up? First coach, you know, gave me that, you know, muscles tears to rebuild itself. And so your muscle has to tear and be able to get more mobility out of that. So that's basically what he told me is the pain's coming from your muscles tearing and then rebuilding themselves instead of, you know, tendons tearing. So, and then the second coach, he was just saying that that was the muscle trying to regain its elasticity back and its full range of motion. <laughs> and in, now that you look back at that, what do you think was happening to your arm? I was destroying it and tearing everything that I had just got fixed. Wow. So what did they do in the second surgery? What did they do um, in the surgery exactly? I had a bicep tenodesis, which they went in and they snipped the bicep off of the labrum that they had just reattached in there. And then they uh, cut about an inch and a half off the bicep and then reattached it into my forearm below the shoulder. Well, yeah, that's a forearm, crazy but, surgery, uh, man. I cannot, I've, I can't believe that you've had to have that surgery. What? What was it like rehabilitating from that surgery? Was it even harder than the first one? Extremely hard. Instead of six months, it was a year. Jeez. A year of not being able to do anything. You know, no lifting, no throwing, no nothing. That that surgery was definitely harder. So now at this point in your career, second surgery after 
all this you've been through with these excessive throwing approaches and all year round baseball, high intent weight of train weight training. Now, where are we at this point in your life? What are you 19 at this time? Yeah. 19. You're in college. You must feel like you're ruined. What, what are doctors telling you? Is your career over? What are they telling you? Well, I the, with the doctor um, before that second surgery, it was, what do you want to do with your life? Do you want to be able to throw? And it was, of course, I still want to be able to throw. All right, then we have to get this surgery done. And then after it, I felt like I probably would never be able to throw like I used to again. So at that time, I was thinking, oh, wow, yeah, this doctor kind of lied to me because I'm not going to be able to throw the same anymore. And I'm not probably ever going to get back to that. That's basically what I was feeling at that time. And then after the second surgery, d did you have any hope you would play again? Um, yeah, but not in the form that I wanted to. Definitely just as like a hobby now. That's that's basically how I felt about it, is that I'd never get back to being what I was before. Man, that's that's brutal, dude. I've you know, I've been there with the rotator cuff tear at 18, man. It, it, I got very depressed. I don't know where you went with it. It's a tough place to be. I totally know yep. wh what you're going through. I think the best thing of all this is understanding what went wrong and, and telling your story here and also telling us what you're looking for in the future. I mean, so first, in hindsight, look back to this. Like, what did you learn? What, what did you get out of this? And what do you want to tell people? I learned that, you know, you got to be patient, you know, you got to take what you have at the time and go for it. You know, you got to take s small steps and moving forward. You got to wait for your body to develop. You got to build from your core out and not try to isolate something and use a quick fix to get to somewhere you want to be. Take the time, do it right. And it'll work out in the end instead of taking the quick fix like I did and ruining yourself. Are you angry at these coaches at all? Uh, I can't really be angry at him because, you know, I was the one that also went through it, but more disappointed, more disappointed that they kind of took advantage of me with a quick fix like that to try and, you know, boost their team at the time when in hindsight, you know, summer baseball doesn't really matter compared to college baseball, you know, because you're just ruining a kid's dream to try and better your, your summer baseball team. Right, man. And, uh, that's that's brutal do you do you feel when you look back now do you feel there's or have you learned there's an alternative do you feel like if you could do this all over again you would have done it very differently yeah most definitely probably wouldn't have isolated my arm as much as i did i probably would have taken care of my body as a whole a whole hell of a lot better and not just gone for the quick fix like i was saying so what advice would you give to guys looking, you know, to enhance velocity when it comes if they're deciding between weighted balls or, you know, whatever they want to do? What what advice would you say to them? Work on your mechanics, hit the gym and stretch and ice your arm every night. Mm -hmm. And what do you have going forward, man? Give us some hope for you. What are you looking forward to now in the rest of your life with baseball? Uh, staying in the game any way I possibly can, whether that be through training or coaching, you know, I'll play in the free time, play some catch here and there, but I'm just trying to stay with the game because it's what I love and it's what I know. Absolutely. And, you know, maybe I can use my knowledge to help people not go down the same path I did. Hey man, that's, that's how all this works. And that's why I wanted to get your story out. Um, as much as you're going to have a lot of guys that are going to, you know, somehow make it sound like it was your fault or your stupidity which is ridiculous. Um, you're, you're telling your story and you're actually going to catch the ear of some young kid, maybe 15, right where you were really wanting to make a team or, you know, you know, make it to college one day and, and, and is looking for a, a way to make gains and, and you're, you're letting them know, Hey, there's, there's high risk in this, right? I mean, that's, that's really what the story is here. There's high risk in, in, velocity enhancement because unfortunately we're in a sport that has a pattern of injury but the problem is i just don't like it how they make it sound like well we are all getting gonna get hurt so why don't we just uh it, it doesn't matter it doesn't matter where, what we're gonna do because we're all gonna get hurt but that's not true more people are getting hurt with more throwing 
And just like you said, we can still make gains and enhance ourselves as baseball players without having to excessively throw. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I would definitely agree. Okay. Well, any last words, man? I'll give you the last word. Anything last you want to say out there to anybody? I mean, this is your last last uh, word in, in this great um, testimony. I mean, just from what you've gone through. I mean, if you're young and you're a late bloomer, don't look at someone else that's early develop throwing 92 94 in high school and take a quick fix to try and get yourself there do you want to throw 92 94 in high school or do you want to do that in college when your body's fully caught up to what you need to be at don't try and take the short route there and ruin yourself like i did work hard take care of your body and do it the right way Hey, this is awesome, man. I really, I really appreciate this. I think this is going to um, mean a lot to a lot of people. I think you're going to help a lot of people. And I appreciate you um, sharing your story with us, man. And, no problem. Uh, I appreciate you guys having me on. Thanks, Trent. Hey, man, and I wish you the best, dude. So, yeah, best of luck, man. Hey, hang on. I'm in the you. interview right now. So that, I hope you in, uh, enjoyed that interview. I hope you we're willing to share that with someone who needs to hear that. Um, I think that injury, just for me personally, knowing how shoulder injuries work, that's a devastating injury. Um, basically, his rotator cuff is destroyed um, and completely, you could say, reconstructed at that point. Um, it's not a good place to be. I, but, you know, I, I believe the body can overcome anything. I give him all the hope in the world to, to recover uh, his career, and, and I would help anyone do the same. But it's still, once again, it tells us of the harsh reality of using extreme throwing to enhance performance when we're already in a sport that has injury problems. It'd be like using, taking uh, football players that have concussion problems and, and you know making them hit harder so uh, the game hits aren't as bad. It doesn't matter. They're already... They have too much trauma on the head already. Using a training approach that exaggerates that or makes it extreme to force them to, like Darwinism, to survive is ridiculous. Um, when you look at the studies, it's the opposite. Uh, professional pitchers are better at putting less stress on their arm than, than, um, than amateur pitchers. That's how they survive. Guys that survive this game get better at putting using more of their body to reduce stress on one limb that's the key and amateur pitchers struggle at that so taking an approach that actually does the opposite guys i just at this point like i said when you have a you come from a perspective of an injured pitcher it's just crazy to hear that that's what we're doing to these kids it's hate, crazy to hear that those coaches what they did to trent and what they said to trent it's just it's sickening it gives makes me sick at my stomach but Stephen, you were talking like, how do you, how does this all come in light? I mean, what's, where did this, the problem come from? It's, I mean, everyone has the right to do their own training, but the problem was when they put this on, on social media and, and they, they really marketed this to young kids. Don't you feel like that's when the problem well, arose? I was, I was just saying that it's the problem with marketing and on social media is you have to understand that on social media, what's like the average age of kids that are watching all this stuff. It, it's it's 13 to, you know, 30-year-old people on Instagram and, and whatnot. But if you have these kids, like in Trent's case, this 15-year-old kid, um, and he's looking for any edge uh, possible because um, he wants to go play at the next level, he wants to go play at the college level, and you market these high-intent weighted ball throws like they're the greatest thing since sliced bread, yeah, and, and and showing and then flashing up these high ball speeds, and then in the, in throws that are going to typically allow you to throw harder because they're running throws, um, and at with professional pitchers too. It's not like your your fifteen year old average kid. It's professional pitchers. Yeah, can how can you not expect the fifteen year old kid to want to do the same? Yeah, I it, it's. And that's that's the thing. But then also, it, it, like on the last one, Noah was 15, and all of these people are, what's a 15-year-old doing touching a weighted ball? 
What do you mean? It it's been blown up on their on social media is 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 news. It's their news networks now. Like that's everybody's on Instagram. Everybody's on Snapchat. Everybody's on Twitter. That's all they're on. They look at that stuff, and it it's been blown up in their world as the next the next great thing. A uh, uh, baseball, you know, MLB.com coming out with the article or weighted balls, the wave of the future. Look at all these professional pitchers. And, that, and you know, that's them. the irony of all this is a lot of. You said the, those organizations that use these high intent weighted balls to sh- flash up these numbers, they put that out there. They go viral. They don't get that many negative comments. But then when us, when we post up the repercussions of a true story of someone going through that, it doesn't go as viral, but it gets ridiculed. So it's like you, we, we, we have a, uh, we have a, a community that is excited to see this high intent training, but they don't want anyone to show the repercussions and the bad side effects of pitchers at 15 blowing their arm out, arms out because of it. So I'm, I'm the, I'm the worst person or I'm a scam artist. I'm an asshole because I said, Hey, look, you're hurting people by doing this. But yet the ones that are showing, flashing up the numbers and making it look like that this is the best way to train they're idolized. That, that that's what just blows my mind. I don't care. Whatever. <laughs> I really don't care. I just really think the reality of that is is twisted. Am I wrong? Well, I I, it, I think if that's the case, and people are saying, okay, like a 15 year old has no business throwing a weighted ball then like like you use the example with cigarettes on a carton of cigarettes you flip the back and it says hey guess what smoking causes cancer and kills then i'll say on those videos that you know if you're below this age don't start doing this yet because people see that and it's so easy to implement it's so easy to buy weighted balls and implement it that it's it's hard for you to regulate so you have to do a better job of educating well, them. And people got mad at me because i said weighted balls should be illegal what did they have to do with the cigarette companies they had to make it illegal for them to market to underage kids they they obviously had to, you had to be a certain age to buy it they had to put that requirement or that threat on those organizations and the problem is is in this because it's not as serious as cancer and death but I mean, tell you the truth, you're risking your life when you have surgery. Yeah, when someone's cutting <laughs> They're you putting, putting you putting to you sleep under. and you could not wake up. Yes, that is scary. But I don't see the government coming into this industry going, sorry, we've got way too many kids under the knife because of this form of training. We're going to make it illegal. And people are going to think I'm making blowing this out of proportions. It's not blown out of proportion, guys. I will continue putting these interviews up if you don't believe us. Because I'm not making this up. And until you don't want to deal with it, I'm going to keep putting it out there. We need to deal with this. Because no government's going to help us deal with it. And it is a problem. We shouldn't be hearing stories like Trent. We shouldn't be hearing stories like Noah. Like the countless others I have to interview. We sh- I shouldn't have that list in my phone of all these people with these stories. I'll tell you right now, I never had that list before Weighted Balls got popular again. Because they've been out forever. I never had that list. I mean, Stephen, you started working here when the boom started happening. And you saw my reaction to the calls that we kept getting. I was freaking out. I was mm-hmm. like, another one. Yeah. Oh, my God, another one. Yeah. Because I was blown away. I'd been in the industry long enough, and I never heard that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I just think even in the last reaction, even to Noah's video, like I, I'm going through our DMs, answering all these DMs yesterday and, uh, you know, two people talking about one guy who got injured, uh, you know, doing a weighted ball approach. The other guy was talking about how he has arm pain and what he should do because he's in it. Um, and then, you know, even on Noah's video, some of the comments, some people are, you know, saying it's uh, it's fake and whatnot. And then and then dad's coming on to it and saying, would you like me to send my medical bills of, of yeah, right. my of my son having to go through the same exact issue? Like it like I. I, I I don't like that it's treated as like this non-issue. And if there is these guidelines that that companies believe um, uh, people shouldn't be throwing them at a certain age or they need to be doing these protocols, then they need to be educating people far better than what's going on. They need to actually be selling them. They need to be putting them on the balls, like you said, with the cigarette cartons. When you buy a case of weighted balls, you should have the disclaimer that says... 
if used incorrectly or not following our protocol or if pain exists, you need to stop because you can seriously end your career. Yep. That needs to be on the balls. But like I said, once again, the government forced cigarettes to do that. I don't see the government forcing baseball to do that. Well, I mean, I'll think of how many programs that are just baseball facilities that have hundreds of kids um, that they're training that can ju- it's just so easy for them to implement this form of training remember, and do it in a mass in a and, mass and approach. Remember when when it when it first got popular, the call we got from three X coach that said his local academy implemented it with like sixty kids and twelve of them had had to have or got injured and had to have like a lot of them had to have surgery. Yeah, I don't I've heard. I mean, I've even heard of the, the um, my friends who are playing in college. Their whole their whole college programming implementing it which i mean i think starts throwing out the the whole assumption on what age you should be doing it because guys are getting hurt the most elite athletes are blowing out their arms regardless of weighted balls at in in the baseball levels but it's it's like i, I, I know i know people are gonna say that's anecdotal well the studies we have are the asmi study which has been ignored on really what it says now asmi says can be beneficial or maybe beneficial maybe risky they're not really telling us what it is, but if you read it, you see torques go up when you take a six, seven ounce ball from the mound to fl- to a crow hop throw. They go up and the ball speed doesn't. So those are called inefficient throws. Arm speed's going up, torque's going up, ball speed ain't changing. Now, when they did that with the five ounce, it didn't happen. The five ounce, they didn't normalize the ball speeds, but it it indicates the five ounce actually would have lost torques when it went to the crow hop. Then we had the six week study that's out of 35 pitchers, three got injured with the weighted balls. One had to have surgery and the, and when they threw the regular balls or the group that threw the regular balls didn't have any injuries and didn't have the increase in total range of motion, which made them more susceptible to injury. So we have studies, not enough, not nearly enough. I mean, we're going to be doing this for another 15 years, guys, but what do we do with the kids now? So we can't just blow this off. What are we going to do with the kids now when we have these stories like Trent and we have these stories like Noah and we have more stories coming? Like, guys, when are we going to do something about it? When are we going to put those disclaimer on the balls? Or when are we going to stop this form of training? Or when are we going to do a better job educating on the kids on better alternatives? Yeah, so, I mean, along those lines, what are what are the alternatives? Because I, I, like, I understand people are see, like putting out all this information against these high – uh, just year-round throwing programs, high intent. So what's what's the alternative? What do guys need to be doing? Um, well, we, we did a video on it. So we did a video on YouTube, Better Alternative to High Intent Throwing, and we worked really hard on that video, and mm-hmm. it's turned out really well. It's It's gotten over a 1,000... Well over a thousand views in a few days, just on YouTube. Well, I think even that is just that's that's that was one piece, but I mean, adding everything in together of strength and conditioning, uh, nutrition, yeah. mobility, learning how to develop yourself as an athlete, as opposed to this mindset of baseball that it's so you know skill specific. I I think just yeah, that only alone throwing helps throwing, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I I just think that alone of of building better athletes is going to reduce reduce the risk of injury in baseball but baseball is really yet to take that approach and run with it yeah and a lot of people are saying well they're doing it major league teams are doing it and um you know chapman's doing it and these guys guys you gotta understand at the major league level i don't think i would be surprised if someone at the major league level um in on a major league field is doing these at high intent are running and throwing these things as hard as they can I find that hard to believe. And I think that's where you've been misled because I haven't seen that video. Have you seen anyone do a full running throw with a weighted ball on a major league field? Well, on a major, in spring I, training. I, mean, I saw Michael Kopech do it and obviously all the... Uh, oh, yeah, but that was not that was in someone's training facility. Yeah, I mean, it was just... But no, of, I, I haven't seen a major league organization buy into the high intent version of these well, weighted I mean, balls. I was you know, just talking with you know one of the guys here who's a major league baseball player and he said it's it's... A very small amount of major league players um, are doing it, and maybe you know, it, it, and it, uh, some minor league guys. But it's like it's not something that it's not like every guy is doing it. But but I think a lot of kids think, well, th- the same approach, this high intent form of weight weighted ball training, is being used on major league fields. Yes, and, and in I, colleges. And- and it, you know what? I might say okay at the colleges, but I have yet yet to see it on a major league field. I've seen a major league player do it, but not many. I can count them on my hand. But I haven't seen a major league 
organization implemented on a field. I haven't seen it. If I'm wrong, send me the video. I'd like to see it. I'm telling you right now, I'd like to see it, but I haven't seen it. So I think a lot of kids are saying, well, you know, the Dodgers are doing it or the Indians are doing it. I see their stations for weighted balls, but I've yet to see someone actually in the act of running as hard as they can and throwing a weighted ball in their um, on their fields or, or on their, in, you know, whatever, on their facilities. Um, so that's the thing is I, I think that there's a bit of misleading there and that Chapman does it. Chapman just, what I saw was just picking them up and throwing them nice and easy. Yeah. He was going through all different levels of weighted balls, but it was just all easy throws. I didn't see any high intent throws from him. Um, so I think a lot of that needs to be cleared up. A lot of more information has to come out. I do think it's a shame that a lot of these camps that have sold you on the big numbers that come out of these running throw way to ball approaches, like how to flash the boards with these high numbers in running throws. Um, and also, you know, showing guys in a running throw and then on the mound, which I feel are more just, you know, highly skilled throwing athletes that are just coming into this training and making it look like they made these big gains. Um, I feel like if they're going to show us all that, they got to show us or give us more information than what they're doing. They've got to say, hey, this is kind of how our programming works. Um, and this is what we do to stay safe. And this is what we find that guys get injured. They do this, this, and this. I think those organizations need to do a better job of giving um, a full understanding of how this works so these 15-year-old kids aren't ignorantly walking into this. Or some you know, pitching instructor in a local academy goes, hey, I got to make some money and this is really popular right now. So I'm just going to kind of knock off my version of a high intent weighted ball program and, and put these kids through it at 15 and guinea pig them. And then you get uh, stories of Trent and, and, and Noah Turley. Yeah. And I mean, I just last thing for me, too, is like I, I put together that the the micro content video that I, that we put on the Instagram. People are like, oh, you're you're using scare tactics. You're, you're just like you're an online marketer, like you're just using you're just using scare tactics. And I'm sitting here going, the irony of this is that online marketing is what brought around this craze. So good point. It's like you're right on the other end. It's like they weren't using marketing to make this form of training look so uh, inviting and so effective, right? Mm -hmm. So you can you can use the marketing to sell us uh, the crack, but you can't use the marketing to show us that the crack kills. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So I thought I thought that was interesting. Very very much interesting. So if if you have uh, any questions or comments, please leave them here. You'd like uh, if you're someone out there that's been injured by high intent weighted balls or extreme throwing, and you'd like to tell your story, we want you to use this venue to 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 do that. Please reach out to us. Um, we'd like to tell tell your story unedited, uh, which we've worked very hard to do with Trent and Noah. Uh, no editing at all. This is what we recorded um, through a Skype call or through a phone call. And uh, we want to do that for you, allow you to tell your story. So um, appreciate you listening. See you in the next episode.